All right, we're gonna kind of get started here. I'm gonna do an introduction here for a couple of minutes and people can still keep filing in and then I'll turn it over to our speaker. Um, so my name is Zach Hall. I work at the Campbell Creek Science Center as an educator. Um, at the Campbell Creek Science Center sits on the traditional homeland of the Denina people. We thank the Denina people for their continued stewardship of these lands and we commit to care for this land and treat all people and things with respect. The mission here at Campbell Creek where I work is to engage all learners in outdoors experience that increase appreciation, connection, and stewardship for Alaska's public lands and natural resources. Here at Campbell Creek Science Center, we serve 45,000 people each year at our beautiful campus in Anchorage with outreach to communities across the state and through online virtual programs. So as you guys are kind of finding out, they are on a webinar right now. Um, your way to communicate with us is through this chat box. Um, you will be muted and we will not be able to see you throughout the duration of the um, presentation here, but we really want to interact with you. and We want you guys to ask a lot of questions. So you got the chat box here. You'll see there's a questions and answers box. And if you can ask questions throughout the presentation, um, we'll kind of keep track of that. And then at the end, we'll have some time to answer some questions. And if you like someone else's question, please like it. So it kind of goes to the top. We know that's an important question to ask there at the end. Um, the program is being recorded because we do plan to post this recording on the BLM Alaska YouTube page. Um, I'm going to show you guys a couple other upcoming events, and I'll even put the, the link in the notes here. Um, we have another presentation on October 20th at 7 p.m. It's a fireside chat about she fish on the Kuskokwim River. And we also have another dinosaur presentation on October 26th at 7 p.m. about dinosaurs in the north, and I'll be given that one. Um, so today is National Fossil Day, but a lot of you are aware that's kind of why we're putting this on. Um, National Fossil Day is an annual celebration that highlights the scientific and educational value of paleontology and importance of preserving fossils for the future generations. We are excited to have Do Dr. Pat Drunkenmiller here today to help us celebrate. Pat is a paleontologist, the director of University of Alaska Museum and a professor of geological sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. His research Emphasis is on Mesozo Mesozoic marine reptiles and dinosaurs of Alaska. He has conducted paleontological fieldwork across the state. We asked Pat what, how he became interested in Alaska's dinosaurs. He said that when he came to Alaska in 2007, he quickly realized that Alaskan dinosaurs were truly remarkable and vastly understudied. The potential for new discoveries was and still remains tremendous. Once more, these discoveries have the potential for great scientific scientific significance in Alaska, North America, and the rest of the world. Alaska is arguably the best polar dinosaur record on the planet. That's really cool. He also told us that he really enjoys the challenges of studying in Alaska, Alaskan dinosaurs, both the difficulties of reaching re his remote study sites and the physically and intellectually challenging nature of the work itself. Tonight, we get to learn about the fruits of his hard work and comfort at the comfort from our homes. Um, it's awesome that I get to introduce Pat uh, and Miller, um, and I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you for that. We're going to do a quick little, quick little bit of technology here, and I will share my screen, and we'll get going. Oh, I'm going to put it on the first slide. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, happy Fossil Day, uh, and thank you for that introduction. And I'm, um, I'll just start by saying that what I want to tell you about tonight is it's not just my work, it's the work of many people, uh, my collaborators, students, volunteers who really helped uh, dig these fossils up, study them, and understand them more completely. Um, so I have many collaborators. Uh, Kevin May here at the Museum of the North in Fairbanks is a longtime uh, Kindred Spirit, um, Greg Erickson at uh, Florida State University, and um, some uh, Kayla Brown, Don Brinkman from uh, the Tyrrell Museum of um, Paleontology in Canada, and Jalen Aberly from uh, University of Colorado, and actually many more than that. But I just wanted to highlight a few of those uh, important people. So as, uh, as you know, yes, today is Fossil Day, very exciting. Um, I'm really tickled that uh, to see that the National Fossil Day logo is highlighting Alaskan dinosaurs. And um, I think the first thing you know, really I wanted to point out is, is to remember that 
Um, really most of what we know about Alaskan dinosaurs uh, comes from fossils that we collect on public land. And um, in this particular case, we have a scene of a tyrannosaur sort of sniffing the ground on the following the tracks of a duck-billed dinosaur, uh, a scene taken from some of the work that we've done in Denali National Park in Preserve. Um, but at the same time, one of the ways that we better understand Denali fossils is by studying, and Denali tracks, is by studying the bones and the teeth of these same dinosaurs way up in the far north in, um, in, what, in the, what we call the North Slope, the northernmost regions of Alaska, and actually on public land managed by the Bureau of Land Management, um, which is part of a, a parcel of land, a huge parcel of land called the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, amazing piece of Arctic real estate full of dinosaurs. So I'd like to uh, take the time to acknowledge um, both the logistical and the financial support of these two agencies, as well as the National Science Foundation, which has supported our work on and research in Alaskan dinosaurs now for many years. Well, Alaska is a pretty amazing place when it comes to studying fossils. Um, and in fact, Ray Troll, famous uh, artist here from Alaska, from down in uh, Ketchikan, down in the southeast part of the state, uh, produced this amazing map showing the variety of the scope of fossils that you can potentially find here in, in the state of Alaska. And today, what I'm gonna be doing really is um, narrowing that down and sort of distilling the story to talk primarily about dinosaurs and dinosaurs from these two localities I've already mentioned. Um, the first being Denali National Park and Preserve, which is uh, located there in the sort of the south central part of Alaska. The story of dinosaurs in Denali Park are dinosaur tracks primarily. A handful of bones, we're working on that. Uh, but if you want to study bones and teeth, then the best place really in Alaska is on what we call again the North Slope, north of the Brooks Range. Um, and close to the Arctic Ocean on the land administered again by the Bureau of Land Management, National Petroleum Reserve. That's where we find the bones, that's where we find the teeth, and we also find tracks there as well. And by way of sort of a, a broad introduction here, um, these two sites are very different places to work. Now, in Northern Alaska on the North Slope, the dinosaur bones and teeth are found in a formation we call the Prince Creek Formation. And the way we access those fossils is we fly in, we put together boats. And in fact, that little red dot there in the middle of the screen is in fact, one of our boats. Um, and we float down the Colville River and we get out and we walk along the banks of these bluffs. And those rocks that you see exposed there on the banks of the bluff are uh, exposures of the, of the Prince Creek formation. And this, uh, this is where we find the dinosaur teeth and the bones um, in a whole variety of different manners. Um, on the other hand, when we're look, working in Denali National Park, we're looking in a totally different unit of rock. It's called the Cantwell Formation. And again, here, um, as you can see from this image, the, uh, these rocks are no longer sort of low lying near the river. Uh, the forces of mother nature and plate tectonics have, have shoved and crumpled up these rocks and brought them up. And so they're actually, the rocks are the mountains. And so in order to access the fossils in Denali, in Denali National Park, we get out um, and hike with uh, our fully loaded backpacks into the backcountry, sometimes for many days at a time, walking these outcrops, looking for things like these beautiful dinosaur tracks I'm showing here. So very different kinds of uh, places to work. And the neat thing about these two sites and the reason really why um, we like to work, we like to study both of them kind of together is because they both happen to be about the same geological age. They're about both 70 million year old rocks. And that's pretty interesting. So let me just back up for a second and talk about geologic time very briefly uh, with some more art from Ray Troll. This is a simplified geologic column it represents the rock record from the history of the earth. And our earth is about four and a half billion years old. But if you wanna study fossils, most of that work occurs in the rocks laid down in only the last 500 million years or so. And we divide up those three 
we basically divide up that last 500 million years of rocks into three main chunks, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And today I'm gonna be talking about the Mesozoic, which we also call the age of dinosaurs. And actually these fossils are important because not only do they basically help, um, fossils are not only just fun things to find, they are actually the basis for the divisions of the rock record of all these different periods of time. Mesozoic means middle life, Cenozoic means uh, recent life. And the age of dinosaurs, in fact, dinosaurs were around for about 140 million years. But more specifically, in Alaska, most of the dinosaurs we find are from the Cretaceous period, which is the last of the three periods of time that make up the Mesozoic. The Cretaceous itself is about 80 million years long. It's a vast period of time on its own. The dinosaurs from the Prince Creek and the Cantwell formations are about 70 million years old. And that's pretty cool because they are about the same age means that the information we get from them and actually can be complementary. At the very end of the Cretaceous period was one of the largest extinction events in Earth's history about 66 million years ago. And that's the event that wiped out all the, the non-avian dinosaurs. And um, dinosaurs do still exist today. We, we call them birds. And um, so dinosaurs are still with us. But I, I do want to say that one of the things tonight I'm not going to be talking about are the undinosaurs. Um, just to point out that uh, there are many other fossil critters that uh, extend back way into the geologic record um, that sometimes get grouped with dinosaurs, but actually are not. So I won't be talking about things like marine reptiles that lived during the age of dinosaurs or some of the fossil mammals that existed in the Cenozoic era, like, uh, like mammoths. So another day and another time for that. So as I mentioned, um, what's, really, what's really great about studying these two formations together is that um, because they're the same age, they provide complementary information. When we study the bones and the teeth on the North Slope, they actually um, help us understand who was making the tracks that we find in places like Denali National Park. On the other hand, Denali National Park has so many bones, or sorry, so many tracks that um, they can provide information that then feeds back to help us understand more about the Prince Creek Formation. Um, for example, like the size range of dinosaurs, um, there's really thousands in thousands of tracks in Denali. So by sheer numbers, they provide more types of information and the Cantwell formation has a lot of fossil plants. And that actually tells us about the environment, the plants that were growing there and the temperatures that these animals existed in. Okay, so, what do we know about Alaskan dinosaurs? So at one very basic level, um, really most of the kinds of dinosaurs that we, we know in the state of Alaska, we, we, can, we can coarsely tell what kind of dinosaurs left dinosaur tracks, but we don't know the species. The best way to understand the species that lived in Alaska is through their bones. And based on our studies from the North Slope, we, um, we've, we've determined that there are about 14 different species of dinosaurs that, that existed in the Cretaceous period here in Alaska. I say that knowing fully that we're only seeing a small part of the picture and clearly there were many more than that, but that's what we have um, actual physical evidence for right now. Of those 14 species, only four of those actually have a proper scientific name. And um, part of our job always is to uncover this record more fully and try to understand which species were actually here. Interestingly though, the species that we do have here in Alaska are unique to Alaska. They're not found anywhere else in the world. And probably one of the good reasons for that um, has to do with our geography. So let's take a look at North America 70 million years ago. And this is really quite a remarkable thing. Um, North America might have some broad resemblance to today, but in particular, you can see that, um, in fact, uh, North America was actually sort of split primarily into two chunks, a Western part and an Eastern part. 
The eastern part we call Appalachia, the western part we call Laramidia. And Alaska was way up at the northern end of this um, piece of real estate called Laramidia, separated from the eastern part of North America by a, a shallow seaway. And by the way, that's why you find things like marine reptiles in the middle of Kansas today. But way up at this, um, at this time and 70 million years ago, something really interesting was occurring. North America was located farther north than it is today. And in, that, in fact, what that means that all of Alaska was above the Arctic Circle. In fact, parts of Alaska were on average probably more like 10 degrees of latitude farther north than they are today. And so the dinosaurs then that lived in Alaska 70 million years ago were living pretty darn close to the North Pole. And in fact, they were the northernmost dinosaurs we know of on planet Earth. And that right there sets them apart. That required, that sort of implies that they probably had, had adapted and learned special ways of living in this very remote, um, well, when I say remote, necessarily everything was remote then, but in this um, very uh, different kind of world. And really, I think uh, if there's a message that I'd like to kind of impart on you today is that, as mentioned in the introduction, Alaska really is the best place in the world to study polar dinosaurs. We do have polar dinosaurs known at both hemispheres, um, but Alaska really provides the most um, diverse and abundant record. So let's take a look now at some information from each of these different sites that we work. And I'll start with Denali National Park. Uh, it's a really uh, beautiful and remarkable place to work. We've been working there for several years now. Um, frankly, I hope to be working there for the, the rest of my career as long as I can still have a backpack on. Um, and the, the message here is that dino dinosaur tracks are actually relatively abundant in Denali but that doesn't mean they're always easy to find. And it takes a lot of work to go to some of the places to find them. Um, and it actually, Denali is really one of the best dinosaur track sites in North America. And the way that we really do most of our work in Denali is we hike, we get out. And, um, and again, I mentioned that they like the physical challenges of the work. And this is one great way to do that is carrying a, you know, a backpack full of food for the next uh, for the next week of, you know, everything you have, your tents, your food, and everything with you. Hiking into the backcountry and then spending time walking uh, places like this in expo exposures of the rock for beautiful dinosaur tracks. At the moment, um, I would say that in a very broad brush way, the dinosaur tracks that we find in Denali can sort of be broken into three major groups. Um, there are many different, probably many different species of dinosaurs that were leaving tracks in Denali. Um, and really we know that um, probably the, the most abundant kinds of tracks we find are from duck-billed dinosaurs. Those are called hadrosaurs. So that's here on the, the right of the screen. Um, Ceratopsians are also fairly common. These are a group of large plant-eating dinosaurs related to Triceratops um, that, leave, um, that leave actually two different kinds of footprints from the fore and the hind feet. Those are fairly common. And then theropods. Theropods are meat-eating dinosaurs. And as it turns out, we have a variety, a really interesting variety of meat-eating dinosaur tracks in the park. And we're still trying to figure out exactly who made all those tracks? So let's look at some examples. And I'll start by saying, uh, I mentioned that, you know, it's one thing to say the park is full of dinosaur tracks, but you know, they were only first recognized as occurring in Denali Park in 2005, so very recently. And you might ask, well, what took everybody so long to find the dinosaur tracks in the park if they're so abundant? And the answer to that question should be totally obvious if you're looking at this layer of rock, and my question to you is, do you or do you not see any dinosaur tracks? Because there's a whole bunch of dinosaur tracks right here. And the, the person in the photo here is, is park geologist, uh, Denny Caps, And um, he's actually staring at a layer of rock. And to orient you a little bit, you're looking at the very bottom of a layer of rock that's been tipped up nearly vertically. And it's actually got a whole bunch of dinosaur tracks on it. 
take a minute and see if you find dinosaur tracks. Just kind of stare at that surface. And now let me just quickly highlight some of those tracks. Oh, now take it away. Hopefully you got to see that. So again, take a look at those, that surface. There's some tracks. I'm gonna take them away again. And actually that surface is covered in all sorts of dinosaur tracks. And what he's got his hand pretty much sitting on there are two duck-billed dinosaur tracks. And if your impression was like, whoa, I didn't see it, it's be because you probably were expecting something that was in indentation into the ground rather than something coming out of the ground. So let me explain how that works. Really, there's two big ways that you find dinosaur tracks. Um, you start by having a dinosaur leaves its footprint into the ground, it leaves a hole, and that hole can then fill up later with, other, with another kind of sediment, let's say it's sand. So millions of years later, you fast forward, and what you have actually, are, you've created two types of tracks. The track was originally what we call the true track, it's the indentation, but the infilling of that track is what we call the natural cast. So it's uh, more simply put, true tracks are innies, natural casts are outies. So there's innies and outies, and if you're only thinking innies, you're gonna miss the outies. So there's my scientific explanation. Um, so now that you're experts, take a look at this image. Here are some dinosaur tracks um, exposed um, at a few sites in the backcountry. And I think you can see a really clear three-toed impression there. And on this block of rock, you can see an isolated three-toed track, again, of a large duck-billed dinosaur. These were the big plant-eating dinosaurs, what we call the cows of the Cretaceous period. These were probably the most common animal you would have seen in Denali 70 million years ago before it was Denali. Here's an example of a horned dinosaur track. This is my colleague, Kevin May. Um, he's, he, uh, he found this beautiful footprint. Now you might again say, well, it looks like a, a blob of rock. But you know, when you start to see blobs of rocks and they have one, two, three, four very distinct toes and you see that repeated shape over and over and over again, you start to realize these are not random rocks, these are footprints. These are the natural casts. And in fact, this is a, a footprint from the, the hind foot of a duck, of, sorry, of a, of a horned dinosaur, something again related to Triceratops. It might've been this dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus, I'll tell you about in a minute. We even find remarkable things like this on the, the image on the left there, you see a bumpy surface. And that bumpy surface, you may have guessed, those are, that's skin impressions. Um, those are actual scales from the animal preserved in the rock as well. Pretty remarkable. But what gets really um, kind of blows our mind is I showed you some examples of individual or isolated tracks. Sometimes we find hundreds and hundreds of tracks at one single site. And in fact, the largest single dinosaur track site in Alaska that we found to date is a site in Denali National Park way in the backcountry called the Coliseum. And that's what we're looking at here. You have, uh, have to imagine here that these rocks, again, they were once horizontal when they were laid down as mud and sand, but through mountain building processes in places they've been tipped nearly vertical. That's what you're looking at here, are nearly vertically inclined beds of rock, sand, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud. And every little divot, every little pockmark that you see on all, each of these surfaces is a dinosaur footprint. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur footprints. We tried to count them up and you know, it's, it's, it's probably at least 1200 individual footprints we could, we could count, but undoubtedly there's many more than that. And they occur on many different levels. And in fact, here um, at the bottom, I've, I've highlighted one layer that shows an actual dinosaur trackway. It's a set of tracks in a row from probably, oops, sorry, from a duck-billed dinosaur. A really remarkable site and a site that we've spent a couple of years studying now to try to understand all the different species that occur here. And then there's meat-eating dinosaurs. Um, I mentioned they're pretty, pretty fascinating and 
meat-eating dinosaurs are generally they're, they're they're more rare than plant eaters. Just like today, you're going to see a lot more uh, you're going to see a lot more moose today than you're going to see wolves. Same thing uh, with the predators 70 million years ago. And hopefully now, if you looked at the image on the right, you might have seen a couple of meat-eating dinosaur footprints there. If you look closely, I'll highlight one really nice one there. Um, meat-eating dinosaur footprints are different from plant eaters in that they have long, narrow toes, and the toes are each very well defined. And it turns out there's uh, some sites in Denali that are just chock-a-block full of really interesting meat-eating dinosaurs. And the way we record information, by the way, on these dinosaur tracks is these are national parks. We, we're not out there with a rock saw cutting out pieces of rock and taking them away. We actually can gather data in a lot of different ways without harming the fossils. And one of the ways we do that is through um, making something called a, 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 a sill putty peel. And um, that, those bluish green things that we're holding there are, are peels. They're basically molds of footprints that we found in the backcountry. And actually here's uh, one of the grad students, Tyler Hunt um, from Florida State University, making one of these sill putty peels of a dinosaur track that he had just found. And so it's a soft two-part material that we actually, we mix in the field and then we squeeze into the dinosaur footprint. We let it harden for a couple of hours and then we peel it off and we have a perfect likeness. So it's a great way to bring back the information without harming the fossils. And what we found is, uh, you can see here, a, a range of sizes of meat-eating dinosaur footprints from quite small to actually this really amazing large footprint at the left, which I'd like to highlight. In fact, um, here is that footprint in place in the back country of Denali. And if you look closely here to the left of the screen, you might see it exposed on the surface. And to make that a little bit easier to see, I'm going to take a photo of it here from a different angle. And I think you can see there, there's a three large, long, relatively narrow toes. Now, the size of this, the, the shape of this, this footprint and its size really only leaves one possible track maker. We don't know the species, but we do know unequivocally that this footprint was made by a tyrannosaur and a pretty good sized tyrannosaur at that. And there's actually a pretty good way of telling how big of a tyrannosaur, because what we can do is we can measure the length of the middle toe, that's the third toe of the foot. And very quickly, we can either just multiply that number by four, or actually there's even a special formula to use for tyrannosaurs. And we can get an estimate of the hip height of the animal. And in this particular case, this animal that made this half meter long footprint had a hip height of two meters or up to two and a half meters. That's a pretty good sized critter. And in fact, with a human to scale, um, it puts it even better in perspective. But, but better than that, I can tell you this, here's something pretty remarkable, is that the animal that left that footprint, that's the largest meat-eating dinosaur footprint we found in Denali so far, it was the largest land carnivore that ever lived in the state of Alaska. That's pretty cool. And think of it this way too, like today, when you think of big land carnivores, you think of bears. Well, guess what? Here is, uh, I've scaled this as best I could. Here is the winner from, uh, this is Park Service related too. Uh, just uh, about two weeks ago, they finished up Fat Bear Week, which highlights um, and people get to vote on the, the fattest bear from Katmai National Park <laughs> down on the Alaska Peninsula. Um, here's Otis the bear, the winner this year in comparison to the tyrannosaur that made that footprint in Denali. So um, that bear is nothing to mess with either, of course. Well, there's so much more I'd like to say about Denali, but let me just turn our attention now to the Colville River and the North Slope and talk a little bit about the, the Prince Creek Formation. Getting around in Northern Alaska is very different than working in Denali. And the, the way that we access the field sites in, on the North Slope is invariably we need aircraft. And here we typically fly in usually with fixed wing aircraft, um, sometimes with helicopters, 
We land on gravel bars along the Colville River, which is the biggest river draining the North Slope of Alaska. And it forms actually the Eastern boundary of the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. And uh, once we get there, we put together boats. You can see there's a little inflatable boat there and you'll see it in some other photos. These inflatable rafts are, are basically our, our chariots for getting up and down the river and, and uh, examining these outcrops of rock that have the dinosaurs. And I mentioned um, a little bit earlier that really, um, you know, most of what we know of named species of dinosaurs in Alaska, that information all comes primarily from the North Slope and from the Prince Creek Formation. But the thing I'd really like to emphasize is that uh, with two exceptions, all of these 14 species that we, we find evidence for in Northern Alaska, they're all extremely rare. These bones are very difficult and hard to find, and especially the meat eaters, those bones are really, really rare. Um, and so really um, uh, many of these species are really based on only just a handful of bones and we're always hoping to find more. So far, the best known dinosaur, the one species that we know more about than any other from Alaska is a kind of a duck-billed dinosaur um, that uh, um, left its remains, if you will, in this one very productive layer of rock we call the Liscombe bone bed. The Liscombe bone bed now has, it's, it was first found in the 1960s, but it's been steadily excavated since about the 1990s. And we currently have about over 6,000 bones um, from this one layer of rock. And you can see here some of the bones exposed in place. Um, and in the lower left, you can sort of see, if you look closely, you can sort of make out the bone here in the middle. There's a bone there, there's a bone there. This layer is just packed full of bones. We've excavated many of them. And from this information, we are actually able to name a new species of Alaskan dinosaur which we've called Agrunaluk kukpikensis. So Agrunaluk is about 25 feet long, and it stood, um, you know, it stood probably around about seven feet tall at the hips. So it was a good-sized animal, and we named it Agrunaluk because we used some of the words from the Inupiaq language of the people who live in that area, the native peoples. And Agrunaluk kukpikensis. Uh, roughly translates to the ancient chewer of the Colville River. So uh, that's uh, one of the fun things you get to do as a paleontologist is you get to name new species. Now, most of the species, most of the individuals in this bone bed, the Liscombe bone bed that we found were not adults, they're actually juveniles. Still good sized animals though. They're probably about um, 10 feet long and maybe three feet tall at the hip. So, so good sized critters. We estimate that they were two to three years old. And, um, and so that's really, you know, interesting information. Um, but we would kept thinking, well, okay, those juveniles, you know, I wonder, you know, were these, were these, were these animals actually born? Were they rather, were they hatched in the Arctic? Um, or maybe these were young that actually were hatched out um, someplace far to the south and that they migrated each year to these productive summer environments in the Arctic to feed, kind of like birds do today. Um, we, we just didn't know, like, is, where, where were these animals actually being hatched out and raised? And this has been a long-standing question for, for quite a while. And in fact, um, really answering that question is intimately tied to answering another really long-standing question about polar dinosaurs in general, and that is, were they migrating? or were they staying put? Um, and you know, if, when you consider Alaska's unique geography 70 million years ago, there's a lot of good reasons why you might wanna migrate and leave during the winter. So I mentioned the, the paleo latitude, the, the, what the actual latitude was 70 million years ago, that was practically at the North Pole as far as a, almost up to 85 degrees North latitude. The temperature, and this is information we get from plant fossils, was probably about 40 degrees Fahrenheit on average, so that's averaged out through the whole year. That's very similar to the average uh, annual temperature for someplace like Juneau, Alaska today, our capital down in the, the panhandle. But here's the most important thing. 
uh, I think to the animals that lived up there. Because it was so far north, these animals would have experienced up to four months of complete and total winter darkness. That makes life a difficult, that makes very difficult place to live. And so it kind of makes sense that maybe during the winter months when it was colder, there was probably snow present in the winter that these animals said, let's just get the heck out of there and migrate south. And if they did that, they would have had to have migrated a long distance. We're talking here a thousand kilometers or more. And that would have been just to get down far enough along perhaps the edge of that seaway to get into warmer and more well-lit conditions and someplace where they could find ample food. So these two questions are really very intimately related to one another. And we decided, you know, this would be a great question to really investigate further, but we needed, we needed more evidence. And we needed, uh, if we want to know whether they reproduce there, then we'd either need to find dinosaur eggs or we'd need to find dinosaur babies. And I'll tell you, to this date, we have never found dinosaur eggshell in Alaska. But we did have some really exciting discoveries in two new, new localities, one called Jacob's Bed, the other called Pearl, Paul's Pearls, sites that we just recently discovered um, that actually preserved the bones and the teeth of very small critters. And we were able to look at those bones and teeth and determine they weren't just like small animals as adults, these were, these were very young animals. They were small because they were in very early states of development, right at the point of either they were still in the egg, so they were embryos, or they had just hatched out. And we have a special term for that, we call them perinates. And we excavated these types of fossils out of these new sites for a long time. And in fact, some of the bones and some of the teeth were so small, you really couldn't see them with the naked eye in the field. And so what we had to do was not only dig out little bones, but then we would save all of the sediment that they were in. And we would wash that and we'd wash it over a screen and we tried to sieve out the, uh, the little bones and the little teeth. We did some of that in the field and then uh, we would do more of that back in the lab. So we'd take back buckets of sediment and I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot like panning for gold, except the gold in this case happened to be little baby dinosaur bones. Uh, and it's not easy work standing you know, on the edge of a river in the Arctic. Um, these guys are smiling here, but they're actually pretty cold. So <laughs> it's challenging work. The, the, the good news is at the end of the day, I'm happy to report we found um, we found, in fact, really clear evidence for baby, baby dinosaurs or perinatal dinosaurs in the Arctic that were there nesting in the Arctic. Unequivocally, dinosaurs were nesting in the Arctic, but we didn't just find one or two species. We actually found evidence for seven different families of dinosaurs up there. Um, this includes plant-eating dinosaurs, it includes meat-eaters, it incl includes large species, it includes small species at least members of all these different plant and meat eating groups were actually um, not, they were actually reproducing there in the Arctic. And that alone was a really cool new piece of information that was really exciting to, um, to, to discover. But I mentioned the one of the neat other pieces of information that goes along with this, you know, with uh, understanding that they were nesting there was that it gave us this cool insight into whether or not they were migratory. And um, really, um, I think we've also been able to address that answer really well because for the first thing, to answer that question, could, did they migrate? We now know that based on the physical evidence, I mean, these were very small baby dinosaurs. Even of the large species, like an, a duck-billed dinosaur here, its baby was probably only 18 inches long when it hatched out of the egg. So one of the questions you could ask right away was, would it have been possible for an animal that small to have actually made a one, two, 3,000 kilometer trip from basically a, a size of you know just 18 inches long? I think it's pretty improbable that many of these animals were capable physically because of their size of undertaking such a long trek. 
But that was just part of the story. The most interesting thing had to do with the timing. <clears throat> and what we were able to, to actually do is um, we were able to combine a bunch of different lines of evidence to kind of try to address the question of, of whether or not these dinosaurs had the time with given the environment they lived in that they would have had the time to have both had babies and then migrate south. And so what we were what we were actually proposing here is to think about dinosaurs in a very different way and that is basically on an annual cycle. What were they doing like literally month by month in a given year? And we could do that because we knew about the plants and the annual cycle because of its latitude. So I've made a um, basically a yearly calendar here and I've just made it as a circle. So you can see I've put the months on the outer ring. So winter here at the bottom, there's uh, January, middle of winter, um, June here at the top. I've highlighted how dark it was. So the dark time of year during the winter months, mostly from October to February, uh, constant daylight during the warm summer months. And then let's think about the vegetation because that's what they were, they would have been up there eating for starters. So if they were there year round, first of all, remember winter, 120 days of complete winter darkness, four months. In the spring, probably around March, new plants would have begun to have grown. And this was a polar forest, but the forests were primarily made of conifers that lost their needles every year. So these needles were not on the trees year round. They, were had, they had to grow back every year, just like dawn redwoods and larch do today. The summer months would have been great. Great long growing season, several months, but kind of like we experience here in Alaska today, the swing season, spring and fall would have been very fleeting. By October, the leaves would have been gone and by mid-October, you would have been back into full on winter. So let's think about dinosaurs reproducing in that kind of situation. Here we incorporated another piece of evidence, and this is that we now understand more about the incubation periods for certain groups of dinosaurs. And this is work that was actually done by my colleague, Greg Erickson. And what, um, in a nutshell, uh, found out was that some types of small horned dinosaurs, like protoceratops, um, actually take nearly three months to incubate their eggs. So they lay an egg, they, they basically incubate it for three months and then it hatches. That's a pretty long time, but for something like a duck-billed dinosaur, it was more like six months. So let's go back to that time scale again. If they migrated, they would have had to have done this. We, we assume they would have arrived about the time that um, the new vegetation would have come out. We give them a, we assume they had a little time to lay their eggs um, by say the 1st of April. If you were a little ceratopsian dinosaur, oh, and I should say, they would need to have gotten out of there by the time the leaves had fallen in October. So if you were a little ceratopsian dinosaur, um, laid eggs in first of, of April, you would have hatched out around the beginning of July, and then you would have had maybe three months to grow enough to migrate. But think about that for a duck-billed dinosaur. They would have had to have if they laid their eggs in early April, they would have hatched in September. That gives you basically no time in order to actually raise your babies to the point where they would have been physically capable of then undertaking a long, arduous trek to the south. The bottom line is, because we know they reproduced there, we know that they were year-round residents of the Arctic. And that's a pretty exciting piece of information because then it sets off which science is great to do. You answer one question, it sets off a whole new round of questions. And really, uh, for any of you budding paleontologists out there, you know this is where we're at right now. We, we're gonna be uh, addressing new questions like, okay, they were there in the winter. How did they overwinter? Were they hibernating? What did they eat? How did they stay warm? What kind of sensory capacities did they have in order to deal with this very challenging environment? These are questions we're only beginning to, to answer. Uh, we need new fossils. We're gonna continue looking for these new fossils. And um, really this is uh, a story that's, uh, that's still being told. Um, and so I, I hope that uh, maybe some of you, younger audience members might be the ones out there helping to, to answer these questions in the future.
So with that, I'm just gonna say again, thank you to uh, Park Service. Thank you to the Bureau of Land Management. Um, thank you to many, many people who've been involved in this work and our funding agencies. Um, too many to name here, um, but I'll stop there and I'll give uh, opportunity for uh, people to ask a few questions. Pat, that was awesome. I learned a lot about dinosaurs. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> ben, it's, it's crazy how much you've found out since you've been there. It's just such a new thing that's got to be exciting every day just because you're continually learning. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Um, I'll start right. off with this one from Matt. He says, do you have a sense of time frame over which Denali tracks were deposited? Would any given location have been deposited in a handful of seasons over, or over a much larger time period? Yeah, good question. Um, the, the timing for the, the, camp, the, the Cantwell formation being formed, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but what we do is we try to date the layers of rocks in the Cantwell formation. And this is an effort undertaken by a number of different people, different groups and geologists. Um, the dinosaur tracks um, at the Colosseum are 69.3 million years old, give or take a few hours, based on some of the work we, some of the layers we dated. The whole formation was laid down probably over the course of at least 5 million years, probably more, and we're still trying to understand that. When you look at an individual layer in a place like the Colosseum, that one layer could have been laid down in just in the course of uh, a day or two during a flooding event, for example, in a river. And then the tracks that were made on it could have been made all in the space of one day, or they could have been made over the space of a couple of years. It's probably more likely a few days to several weeks. It's hard to know how long you know, it took for those tracks to form on each layer. So that gives you some of the kind of a sense of the timing. Okay. Um, next question is from Don Wood. How does repeated freezing and thawing affect fossil preservation or the types of geological formations where fossils are found? Or does their yeah. north maintain a cold enough temperature to keep fo fossils perfectly? Yeah, um, freezing and thawing processes that occur near the surface, like up here in the North Slope of Alaska, they make a mess of fossils. Um, you know, when the water gets in the cracks in the bones and freezes, it expands and it, it can just shatter bones. It, can, it breaks them up into many pieces. We, we would prefer to dig, um, we prefer to dig the bones well into the hill, into the frozen ground that hasn't undergone the freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw many times. They tend to be in better shape, but that's difficult to do because the frozen ground's too hard to dig in. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is the tundra up in that in northern Alaska, yes, it's frozen, it's permafrost, but it's only been permafrost for about maybe two, two, three million years, which sounds like a long time, but these are 70 million year old fossils. Wow. So actually most of the history of these fossils, they were not frozen, um, but, um, but definitely the current you know, the, the process of going from totally frozen to now totally thawed can be very, very difficult on a fossil, <laughs> very hard. Yeah, yeah, it's very dynamic. Um, next question is from Joseph. What is the most common, commonly found dinosaur found in North America? Most commonly found dinosaur in North America, I would say pound for pound, um, duck-billed dinosaurs as a group were probably the most abundant. Horned dinosaurs were also quite abundant. Um, and in some formation, the big long sauropod dinosaurs were also pretty well represented. But broadly speaking, yeah, large plant-eating dinosaurs like duck-billed dinosaurs, very common. Um, they are found um, really from Mexico all the way up to, up to Alaska. Um, and they typically are found in bone bed deposits like we found in Alaska, sometimes containing you know, tens of thousands of bones and who knows how many hundreds of individuals. So they were also herding animals. Oh, that's quite another herding animals. Um, Cindy asks, what is the average lifespan of, of these Alaskan dinosaurs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, one of the things we're trying to understand better is actually how old some of these individual dinosaurs were that we're digging up. 
and one of the ways we do that is pretty much similar to counting rings in a tree and to tell how old it is. Bones grow in a similar manner and you can actually count growth rings in those bones. Here's the trick. Um, not all bones have that. And typically many bones don't have any growth rings and some groups of dinosaurs like plant eaters tend not to have as many growth rings as what you see in meat eaters. So it's really difficult sometimes to find the growth bands. But in the Arctic where the climate was very seasonal, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark every year, they tend to express those growth bands better than ones at low latitudes. So we've used that as a tool uh, to try to understand the age of our dinosaurs. My colleague, Greg Erickson is really a specialist in this area. And what we're finding is probably to reach adulthood for something like a horned dinosaur, probably was it something like, you know, seven, eight, nine years for adulthood and probably something similar for a duck-billed dinosaur. And it looked like a duck-billed dinosaur would have reached nearly full size and slowed down its growth. So by the time it was um, 10 to 13 years old, it was probably not growing anymore, but it was by that time, 25 feet long. Oh, wow. So they grew pretty fast. That's, so that's they, so they grew rapidly when they were young, and then their growth rates plateaued out as they got older. Dinosaurs are big, not because they're really, really old and were like 50 or 80 years old. They were really big because they grew quickly when they were young, and then they, they plateaued out kind of like humans. Oh, okay. That's cool. Um, Christina asks, how did they estimate egg inc incubation for different species? That's a really interesting okay. question. Yeah, that, that is a good one. And that, that actually was based on the same, the same idea. The way it was done and the reason why it was studied for those two types of dinosaurs was because we actually have baby dinosaurs preserved in eggs for protoceratops in that duckbill dinosaur, Hypacrosaurus. Um, and we also know that we know how teeth form. And with it, um, what uh, my colleague Greg was able to do is to take the teeth of those embryonic dinosaurs, scan them using a very specialized type of basically X-ray, count the growth bands in the teeth that the growth bands form on a daily basis. They're called lines of von Ebner. And you can use those to tell how many days it took for the tooth to grow. And then we also know from other studies how long it takes before the teeth develop uh, based on studies of modern animals and all that was combined to make an estimate of how long that egg went from being basically in mom to the time it actually hatched out. So um, there's a really cool paper that describes all of that, but that's, that's the general idea. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's a process. Um, Caroline asks, what is your favorite discovery? Favorite discovery, gosh, you know, um, that's, that's a hard one. I've been lucky. I've been doing, um, I've been doing field work for over 30 years now and had, had the luck to make some fun discoveries over the years um, in different places. It, it's hard for me to think um, you know, of, of, uh, of just one really that pop out. There's many things. I would say though, most recently, um, beginning to realize that these little these little bones and teeth we found in Northern Alaska were babies and starting to find really clear evidence for basically embryonic sized animals and these layers that we were painstakingly digging out. That was really exciting. And um, uh, that's why I, I like our field. It's a little bit like having Christmas every day. You just never know what you, know, uh, what you might find in the field or you might bring back to the lab and excavate out when you get back home. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you guys are kind of like almost detectives. You get new pieces of evidence and put the story together. Yeah. Um, let me see, I have another question lined up. Um, with Dinotrax so abundant in Denali, why are fossil bones so much more rare? Oh I'm yeah, another, about that one too. Another really good question. That one's kind of had a, been a bit of a head scratcher. Um, I will say we are now finding a few dinosaur bones in Denali National Park, but they're really rare and mostly they're pretty fragmentary. Um, but there are a few there. Uh, but th probably the reason why um, tracks are more common is that um, when you know when an animal makes a track in 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 the sediment and it becomes rock, 
um, you know, it really, it's just a shape. It's not like a bone that is actually physical material. A bone is chemically pretty stable, um, but if bones get laid down or deposited in sediment and rocks that, that, um, that are in kind of acidic conditions, conditions that, you know, we, you know, we know there's groundwater moving through the ground. If that groundwater is kind of acidic, it can actually dissolve bones away. And I think the, the soil chemistry at the time those dinosaurs lived there um, was not conducive to bone preservation. It was probably too acidic. And in fact, the reason we find so many nice plant fossils may have something to do with that because plants, when they decay, create more acidic conditions. And that probably is good for plant preservation, wasn't very helpful for bone preservation. So that, that probably has um, a lot to do with it. Very cool. Um, this comes from Luke, age five. He would like to know if there are other places other than Denali and Colville River um, to look for dinosaur fossils or have other ones been found in other places, maybe closer to Anchorage. Yeah, we do. We do look for fossils all over the state. Um, I was down in Katmai National Park actually this summer looking for um, looking for dinosaurs. We we didn't find any on that particular trip, but we have more places to look. Uh, we did find lots of bears, um, but all over the state. That really, what uh, the secret is, is if if you know what the rocks are, if they're the right kind of rocks from the right kind of the age of dinosaurs, there's a potential for for finding dinosaurs. And a lot of Alaska has Cretaceous rocks that are sedimentary rocks that could potentially contain dinosaurs. We have, um, we several years ago made a discovery of many, many dinosaur tracks um, in west central parts of, of Alaska along the Yukon River. Um, there are some dinosaur tracks that have been reported from um, Yukon Charlie National Park. Um, there are places in the Talkeetna Mountains that have some um, dinosaur material that's been recovered, and um, even down potentially in places like Wrangell St. Elias. So uh, many places on the North Slope have the potential for fossils, but you can't see the rocks because they're covered in flat. It's flat and it's tundra. And the only place you can see the rock is along the rivers. So we're always looking. There's plenty more cool stuff to be found in the state. And I think a lot of these remote mountainous areas are going to produce more stuff um, as more people get out and, and look for things. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we are coming up on eight o'clock, everyone. So that's the end of our presentation here. Um, thank you very much for that. That was an amazing presentation. I learned a, a bunch. It's really cool to be in Alaska and know that that stuff's so close. Um, if you guys uh, would like to see if there's any more, there's a lot more questions, but we're not going to be able to get to them all, all this evening. I'm really glad everybody was so excited about dinosaurs as I was uh, watching this. Um, anything to say, Pat? Well, I just like to say, um, yeah, I appreciate everybody spending a little time this evening uh, listening about dinosaurs. Um, we uh, uh, look forward to, you know, finding out more cool stuff and sharing it with you and and again, um, you just you know remember a lot of this is made possible because these 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 fossils were found on public land, and um, you know we're we're privileged to be able to work on those lands, and we work on them because, like um, like anyone, we have to get permits to go onto these lands, so we can't just go on the, onto BLM or Park Service land and collect at will. Uh, we were we went through a permitting process and we're given permission to do this kind of work, so. Um, anyway, be mindful of where you are if you are collecting fossils. The fossils um, are owned by whoever owns the land. And um, so just remember that as you're out poking around. But um, thank you for uh, listening. Yeah, I'll be definitely uh, keeping an eye out now that I know what to look for. Um, if you have time, it would be awesome for you guys. I dropped a link in the thing for a form. Um, give us some feedback about the presentation. And thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll see you. Yeah, thanks again, everyone.